and authority. In Christ, we are perfect. In Christ, we are fit for heaven. In Christ, we are holy. In Christ, we are righteous. That's why Paul says that the righteousness that he had that came by faith was the righteousness of Christ. You and I have been clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Positionally speaking, we are perfect. But there's a second aspect of this, and this is something that you and I are working on every day, and it's called experiential perfection. This simply means we are being made perfect. Perfect. That's something that goes on every day. Another term for that would be sanctification. Or a phrase would be to be made holy. That's what happens when you're dealing with your sin. You are experiencing experiential perfection. You are being made perfect. And a verse that I could give you for that would be 1 Corinthians 1.10. Paul says, Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be made perfect complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. That tells us the whole reality right there that you and I have not arrived. If we have arrived, then we would not have admonitions and exhortations like that. We would not be told here in Ephesians 4.1 to walk in a manner that is fitting to your calling. We wouldn't be told in Ephesians 4.2 to walk in humility and gentleness and patience and showing tolerance for one another in love. We wouldn't be told to be unified if we were perfect. But we're not perfect. The whole point of the Christian life is to move toward experiential perfection. Now there's a third aspect of this perfection. It's what I call ultimate perfection. We will be perfect. Now think about this. Positional perfection, we are perfect. That's who we are in Christ. Experiential perfection, we are being made perfect. That's a daily, moment-by-moment aspect where we yield to the Spirit of God and not walk in the flesh. And third, ultimate perfection, we will be perfect. There's a day coming when we're going to see Jesus Christ and we're going to be like Him. And here's your verse for that, 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet appeared what we shall be. We know that when He appears, we will be like Him. Because we will see Him just as He is. That is ultimate perfection. Now, when you talk about perfection, let's go back to the experiential aspect, okay? Because that's where you and I live. And we are to live in accordance with who we are. That's verse 1. We have been given a high calling, and we're to walk in a manner of that calling. If you remember what he says there, the word worthy meant that we are to walk in a manner, our living is to be balanced with our calling. It's like the idea of scales. They're to be even on each side. Here's your calling, and here is your living. They are to match one another. You run into people all the time. They say that they're Christians, but when they start speaking, you want to say, shut up. I mean, what's coming out of your mouth? It's not something that that is befitting of one who has been called by such a high standard. It's Christ. It's not someone who is speaking of that high standard of salvation. You're speaking like the devil. You're speaking like the world. You're speaking out of the filthiness of your flesh. So the best thing to do is to shut up and don't tell anybody you're a Christian. Because when you live like that and you tell people that you're a Christian, you're giving a bad name for Christianity. You're giving a bad name for the church. You're giving a bad name for change by grace. Because people are thinking, listen, if that's what it's like over there. I don't want to be like that. I've got enough problems in in the whole situation I'm in right now. So why why would I want to come be over there with you when you are no different than me? It's almost like an unbeliever is saying to this so-called professing believer, physician, heal yourself, and then come talk to me. Then I will believe your God. That happens all the time. But let's take it into that experiential realm. And here's a statement that I want to focus in on. God perfects you through the teaching gift of the evangelist and the pastor teacher. Teaching is the pastor's main job. Now, we know teaching does fall in with evangelism because you are teaching people the gospel. You're teaching people what it means to come to God. You're teaching people about the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. You're teaching people about repentance. You're teaching people about what is true belief. So there's teaching associated with that. Teaching and proclaiming the Word of God. But just like I said last week, in the teaching gift of the evangelist, he was the church planner. He came in and preached the gospel to a people that did not know Christ. The Lord brought them to himself. He stayed there and established a church and stayed there long enough for God to raise up leadership. Now, that that would be a long period of time. 
And that leadership would raise up. And out of that leadership, God would give gifts to the church. And one of those gifts would be the pastor teachers. And the pastor teachers would rise up and then begin to perfect the saints for the work of the ministry. And he would do that through teaching. We minimize teaching, but it is such a needful thing in our life. You and I need teaching every single day. In fact, we get teaching every day. It might not be oral, but it's certainly by example, right? You have people in your life that teach you many things. You might not be looking at it that way, but they do teach you by how they live. But we need oral instruction. We need the preaching of the Word of God. We need the prophecy that the Word of God talks about, the prophesying, if you will, that preaching of the Scripture. We need to see the teaching of the Word and understand what it means by what it says. Therefore, we're going to be able to apply it. Teaching is the main job of the pastor teacher. I mean, think about it. Ephesians 4, 11, verse 11, look down there. He is called a teaching shepherd. That's, that's the literal rendering of the word, a teaching shepherd. So teaching the word, that is the job of the pastor teacher. Receiving the word and ministering it so that the body may grow mainly is the task of every believer. Your job is to receive the word. Your job is to grow in that word and to minister that word to one another through your gifts. And if you're not using your gifts, then how is the body going to grow? Because those gifts are given to everyone. Those gifts are not given to you for personal growth or personal edification. They're given to the entire body. You have that for the purpose of your brother and sister that you're sitting next to. You don't have that for your own personal edification. My teaching gift means nothing unless I have somebody to teach. And the same is for you. Your gift means nothing if you're alone, if you have no one to minister that gift to. Now, the emphasis of Jesus' ministry was what? Come on, I just gave you a hint. It was teaching. What have I been talking about for five minutes? It was teaching. That was the main emphasis of his ministry. Let me have you to turn to Matthew chapter 4. And let me just show you, this summarizes... His ministry, if you look there at verse 23, it says, Jesus was going throughout all Galilee. What's the next word? Teaching. Teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. See, Jesus did more than just heal people. He did more than just deliver people. He taught them. Go to chapter 5. Look at verse 1. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and began to teach them. And then he goes into the famous Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the gentle, and so forth. This was the emphasis of his ministry. And guess what? This is to be the emphasis of the pastor teacher. 1 Timothy 3.2 tells us that he is to be apt to teach. What's that mean? That means that he is to be teachable and he is to be skilled in teaching. It's, It's talking about two sides of the same coin. Listen, he is to be one who is skilled in teaching. Why? Because that's what he's going to spend his life doing. So he's going to spend his time doing that. That is his main function. Over in Titus 1.9, when it's also listing the qualifications of these elders, pastor teachers, it says that he is to hold fast the faithful word as he has been taught. So he has had some kind of teaching, training him, preparing him, skilling him in this task that he is about to undertake. So he has been taught, and he's holding fast to that faithful word. And then it goes on to say that he may be able, by sound doctrine, both to exhort... And convict those who contradict. So he's going to take that word he has been taught in. And he in turn is going to, by sound doctrine, exhort and convict those who contradict. He's going to teach them the word. He's going to deal with those who oppose the word. He's going to exhort those to proper behavior. So he needs to be skilled in teaching in order to do that. He needs to know by which by where he stands with the word. He needs to know what he believes and able to defend it biblically. Paul told Titus... In chapter 2 and verse 1, he says, Speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. Sound doctrine means healthy teaching. 
And then he goes in and, and gives that illustration of how to do that by illustrating it with five groups that are in the church that he is to give sound doctrine to. In verse 15 of chapter 2, he even makes an even stronger statement when he says, These things speak and exhort and